All right, hi everybody. Uh, this is Jeremy Weiss, your instructor for Philosophy 112 Ethics here at Pikes Peak Community College in the spring of 2020. Uh, and today we're going to do a lecture on Robert Nozick, which is our third third discussion of our topic, inequality and distributive justice. So Rawls, as we've seen, uh, John Rawls specifies two distributive criteria that a society, or rather its fundamental institutions, have to meet in order for the distribution of goods in that society to be just. First, each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive basic liberty compatible with a similar liberty for others. This, plus the fact that Rawls claims that A always trumps B if there's a conflict, is usually called the priority of liberty. And the second criterion, the second principle, is that insofar as is compatible with A, social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they're both one, to the greatest benefit of the least advantaged, and two, attached to offices and positions open to all under conditions of fair equality of opportunity. This, and especially part one, is the difference principle. So Rawls thinks that these are the correct criteria first because they could reasonably secure the unanimous agreement of self-interested, mutually disinterested, rational people who don't know who they'll be in the society they'll create. But why does that matter? Well, because those, as we saw last time, seem to be the fairest conditions for choosing or assessing principles of justice. And it's because it's only if principles pass that test that it will be rational for everyone in the society to accept that society's distribution of primary social goods. And so it's only if uh, principles pass that test that uh, the principles or the, the distribution that's generated is legitimate in an important way. Second, Rawls thinks these are correct criteria because they could actually be adhered to once the veil is lifted. Right? These are principles that, like, if you know that the worst off person in your society is as well off as they could possibly be under any distribution, then you can actually live with the, the, in the society just generated. And that's good. Right? We want these principles to be uh, something we can actually live with. And then it's also uh, Rawls thinks that these are the correct criteria because they accord with our sense that nobody deserves their starting points. Right, As we saw last time, the fact that we're born unequal in a variety of ways is not itself unjust, but we shouldn't let uh, these kind of morally arbitrary contingencies of birth and background determine what our life prospects are going to be and Rawls thinks that his uh, kind of his principles and his methodology prevent that from happening, and that's a good thing. Now we're going to look at two important critiques of Rawls, uh, and they're not just critiques of Rawls; they're interesting in their own right. Uh, the first of which, though, that we'll talk about today is Robert Nozick's critiques of Rawls and his theory. Nozick, as we'll see, is much less egalitarian than Rawls. But then next time we're going to look at Kai Nielsen's. Uh, distributed principles of distributive justice, and Nielsen is actually more egalitarian than Rawls. So let's get to work on Nozick. So here are Nozick's basic starting points. So this is Robert Nozick there in that image. Uh, as we did with Rawls, we'll always include a picture of Nozick on slides that include new direct quotes from Nozick, so you have a kind of visual cue that direct quotes are coming up. So here's Nozick's starting points. He says, the subject of justice and holdings consists of three major topics. The first is the original acquisition of holdings, the appropriation of unheld things. This includes the issues of how unheld things may come to be held, the process or processes by which unheld things may come to be held, the things that may come to be held by these processes, the extent of what comes to be held by a particular process, and so on. We shall refer to the complicated truth about this topic as the principle of justice and acquisition. The second topic concerns the transfer of holdings from one person to another. By what processes may a person transfer holdings to another? How may a person acquire a holding from another who holds it? Under this topic come general descriptions of voluntary exchange and gift, and on the other hand fraud, as well as reference to particular conventional details fixed upon in a given society. The complicated truth about this subject, we shall call the principle of justice in transfer. 
and we shall suppose it also includes principles governing how a person may divest himself of a holding, for example, passing it into an unheld state. All right, so those are the first two topics of justice. Here's a third. Some people steal from others, or defraud them, or enslave them, seizing their product and preventing them from living as they choose, or they forcibly exclude others from competing in exchanges. None of these are permissible modes of transition from one situation to another. And some persons acquire holdings by means not sanctioned by the principle of justice and acquisition. The existence of past injustice raises the third major topic under justice and holdings, the rectification of injustice in holdings. If past injustice has shaped present holdings in various ways, some identifiable and some not, what now, if anything, ought to be done to rectify these injustices? Okay, so these are, given the way that Nozick sees things, these are our three major questions when we're trying to figure out whether a distribution of goods, right, who has what, whether that's just or not. The questions are, does everybody have, uh, well, let me, let me postpone and uh, finishing that sentence because we'll come back to it in just a second. But these, these are what he sees as three major topics of our, our subject. So according to Nozick, as we can see even from that initial presentation, how a distribution came about is going to be very, very important. And here's his basic case, I think, for thinking that's true. It says that from a just situation could, sorry, that from a just situation, a situation could have arisen via justice-preserving means does not suffice to show its justice. The fact that a thief's victim voluntarily could have presented him with gifts does not entitle the thief to his ill-gotten gains. Justice in holdings is historical. It depends upon what actually has happened. Right now, as we talked about last time, uh, Rawls and a number of other people in the social contract tradition say that what matters to determining whether a government is legitimate or a distribution of goods is just or whatever is whether people kind of could have agreed to that government or that distribution or whatever, right? So this kind of, this, this import, idea of hypothetical consent becomes very important. But what Nozick's doing here is kind of denying that in a way, right? That's the example of the thief and the gift giving. Right, just because you could, somebody could have consented to give their money to the burglar doesn't mean that the burglar is actually entitled to what they stole. Right, so hypothetical consent is not going to play the starring role for Nozick that it played for Rawls, for example. And that's going to be important. So what I want to do is I, I want to kind of start by presenting Nozick's theory that he calls the entitlement theory and try to kind of flesh that out as much as possible. And then uh, after that, like we usually do, I guess, uh, look at arguments he gives in its favor, and then we'll turn to questions about his critiques of Rawls and so on. So here's Nozick's entitlement theory in an ideal world, right? In a world where there's no injustice. He says, if the world were wholly just, the following inductive definition would exhaustively cover the subject of justice in holdings. One. A person who acquires, acquires a holding in accordance with the principle of justice and acquisition is entitled to that holding. All right. So if, if you justly acquire something that nobody else owned before you, you're good. You, it's just for you to have it. You're entitled to it. Two, a person who acquires a holding in accordance with the principle of justice and transfer from someone else entitled to the holding is entitled to that holding. Right, so if you get something from someone by just means and they had a title to it, then now you are entitled to it. Now, in a perfect world, right, in a world without injustice, that's it. Right? Principle 3 says no one is entitled to a holding except by repeated applications of 1 and 2. Right, that would be all we need. Right, the complete principle of distributive justice would say simply that a distribution is just if everyone is entitled to the holdings they possess under the distribution. Right, so in a world without injustice, principles one through three cover everything. That's all we need to know about whether a distribution is just is whether everybody satisfies those conditions. Now, in this view, 
right? Nozick says, equal schmequal, difference principle, schmifference principle. As long as each person is entitled to what they have, then there's no distributive injustice, says Nozick, no matter how unequal things might be.